Today's featured guest is Volkan Simon of Expropriate Deutsch Wohnen and Company. He is joining us from Berlin. Now I'd like to introduce our co-hosts. They will give some welcoming remarks in Korean. Let's welcome Oh Jang-nok from Yongsan Citizen Alliance. 안녕하세요. 어, 지역과 각 부문 영역에서 활동하고 계시는 여러분 반갑습니다. 저는 평화와 참여 지역 공동체 용산 시민연대 공동대표 오장록입니다. 용산 시민연대는 용산이라는 지역에서 지역 공동체를 일궈가는 작은 시민 단체인데요. 어, 코로나 팬데믹이 지구 공동체를 강타하면서 여러 어려움들이 생겨났습니다. 그 중에서도 세계적으로 공통적으로 일어나는 현상이 민중들의 어려움을 가중시키는 집값 상승이라고 생각됩니다. 인간의 기본권 중의 기본권인 거주권은 단순히 자본주의적 경제 논리로만 재단해서는 안 되는 권리임에도 불구하고 현재는 수많은 민중들의 고통과 근심거리가 되어가고 있습니다. 오늘 거주권을 지키는 작은 실마리를 찾는 소중한 시간이 되었으면 좋겠습니다. 감사합니다. Thank you for joining us, Yongsan Citizens Alliance. Now we have solidarity for housing rights. 네, 안녕하세요. 저는 한국에서 주거권 운동을 하고 있는 사회복사 이명목입니다. 직걱정 없는 세상년대 한국 사람한테는 이 어감이 정확하게 올 텐데 아마 이것을 번역을 해서 하게 되면 외국인들이 어떻게 이제 좀 이해할지는 궁금하긴 합니다. 우선은 오늘 볼칸 세이먼 활동가와 함께 자담회를 갖게 된 것에 대해서 감사 인사를 드립니다. 한국은 주거 불안으로 많은 사람들이 고통을 겪고 있습니다. 서울은 전체 가구의 50%가 무주택자이고요. 임대 사업자의 임대 주택이 100만 채에 이릅니다. 그래서 내년에 한국에서는 대통령 선거가 있고 지방자치단체 선거가 있는데 이 선거에서 부동산 또는 주거 문제가 가장 큰 이슈 중에 하나가 될 거라고 보입니다. 이런 점에서 지난 9월 베를린에서의 임대주택 몰수 주민 투표는 매우 흥미로운 사건이었습니다. 오늘 볼칸 세이먼 활동가의 활동 사례를 들으면서 한국에서의 주거권 운동 방향과 전략에 대해서 많은 고민을 해 보도록 하겠습니다. 오늘 자담회가 베를린과 서울뿐만 아니라 지구촌 주거권 운동 연대에 출발이 되기를 바랍니다. 끝으로 한국의 주거권 운동 활동가들과 소중한 시간을 나누어 주시는 볼칸 세이먼 그리고 국제 전략 센터 또 통역하시는 선생님들께 감사드립니다. 고맙습니다. Thank you, Solidarity for Housing Rights. Now we have the South Korean Network for Housing Rights. 네, 안녕하세요. 저의 이름은 이강훈이고요. 어, 주거 운동을 하는 사회 활동가이고 변호사입니다. 저는 현재 참여연대와 주거권 네트의 네트워크에서 활동을 하고 있고요. 대표는 아닙니다. 어, 주택 세입자 법률 지원 센터 세입자 114 114라는 단체 센터장이기도 합니다. 독일 베를린 시민들이 민간 임대 사업자 임대 주택 몰수 운동을 해온 것에 대해서 한국 시민들도 깊은 관심을 갖고 있었습니다. 한국에서는 2020년 7월에 법 개정으로 주택 임차인이 2년의 임대차 기간을 1회 연장할 수 있는 갱신 요구권을 인정받았고 갱신을 할 때는 종전 임차료보다 어, 1회 5% 이내에서 임대료를 인상해주면 되는 새로운 제도를 도입했습니다. 그러나 최근 몇년 사이에 서울과 서울 주변의 수도권 도시의 주택가격 인플레이션으로 어, 법 개정을 통해서 임대차 안정 효과를 생각했던 것보다는 그렇게 높은 효과를 어, 보지 못했습니다. 따라서 주택과 토지 투기를 억제하면서도 주택 가격을 안정시키고 장기 공공임대주택의 재고를 충분히 늘려야지만 부담 가능한 주거를 달성할 수 있다. 이런 사회적인 공감대가 한국 사회에서도 확산되고 있습니다. 독일, 독일 베를린 시민들의 보이체 보낸, 보낸 몰수운동은 독일 다른 지역의 
국가나 유럽의 다른 국가들 뿐만 아니라 멀리 한국의 시민들한테도 공공임대주택의 필요성과 방법론에 대해서 새로운 시각을 제공해 주고 있습니다. 오늘 좋은 말씀을 전해 주실 것을 기대합니다. 감사합니다. And last but not least, the Justice Party of Seoul. 네, 안녕하세요. 저는 정의당 서울시당 위원장 정재민입니다. 오늘 독일 도이체 보낸 몰스 운동의 경험을 나누는 화상 간담회를 한국에서 열게 된 것을 매우 뜻깊게 생각합니다. 오늘 행사를 준비해 주신 국제전략센터 그리고 함께해 주신 모든 단체 및 관계자분들한테도 감사 인사를 드립니다. 지금 한국은 부동산 투기 그리고 불로소득으로 인해서 아주 극심한 사회적 결등을 겪고 있습니다. 자산 격차는 더욱더 커지고 있고 또 불평등은 더욱 심화되고 있습니다. 지금 44%에 가까운 세입자들 이 그리고 청년들은 자신의 생에 집을 가질 수 없다는 사실에 매우 절망하고 있습니다. 왜 집한 채 갖는 것이 사람의 꿈이어야 합니까? 네, 이런 사회는 제대로 된 사회가 아닙니다. 네, 제대로 된 나라가 아닙니다. 그래서 독일 베를린의 시민들이 자신들의 주거권을 지키기 위한 이 운동, 소중한 경험을 배우고 그리고 한국에서도 더 이상 집이 재산 증식의 수단이 아니라 모든 시민들의 안정적인 주거권을 보장하는 그런 수단이 되는 계기가 되길 바랍니다. 모든 시민들의 주거권을 위해서 정의당은 함께 싸우겠습니다. 네, 감사합니다. Thank you. It is such a treat for us to co-host with these meaningful organizations. Now, it's the moment we've all been waiting for. De Han Song in conversation with our special guest, Volkan Simon. Hi, uh, hi Volkan Simon. Um, I'm going to just start with a brief introduction. Um, and then perhaps we could get some greetings from you as well. So in Berlin, this September 26, with the 73% voter turnout, 56% of people voted for a referendum that was passed that would expropriate housing from landlords with 3,000 or more housing units. As a result, 240,000 housing units, 15% of the city's housing, from the 12 largest real estate companies, starting with the largest, Deutsche Wohnen, would be expropriated and socialized. This was huge news for the 84% of Berliners, their renters, and have seen their rents nearly double compared to before 2009. And the victory was possible due to the expropriate Deutsche Wohnen campaign that gathered 343,000 signatures to put the referendum on the ballot. We have with us today Volkan, uh, Volkan Simon, who's been involved in the Expropriate Deutsche Wohnen campaign and is a sociologist and researcher at the Technical University of Berlin to talk about the social and historical context, the organizing and visions of social housing that made this victory possible, as well as the fights ahead. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, would you like to give some greetings from Germany also since we have interpretation, uh, if you can make your comments two to three sentences and then pause for interpretation, please. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to join this uh, conversation, um, especially to talk to you um, from South Korea. Um, it is very um, nice to, um, to have this kind of solidarity, solidarity um, also online in these very uh, hard times for all of us who struggle um, for housing rights. So thank you for inviting me and I'm very excited to hear about your um, struggles and how you cope with, with your situation. Uh, thank you. Um, so we'll just jump straight into question number one. Um, so uh, uh, Vulcan, just uh, before we get started, I think it'd be good for us to have some social and historical context about Germany, uh, particularly Berlin's housing market. Uh, given Germany's role as the economic powerhouse of the European Union, uh, there were some people in Korea when we were talking about uh, so how many tenants there were in, uh, in Berlin that expected there to be like more homeowners. So if you could 
briefly provide some historical and social context for the high ra rates of renters, which I believe is about 80%. Uh, and yeah, who is, in, who is not a renter in Berlin? Uh, who are the landlords? Yeah, just if you could give us a little bit of a uh, brief understanding of this. For sure. Um, so as you said, 85% um, of people living in Berlin are tenants or renters. Um, that's very high percentage. So most of the people living here don't own their own homes. Um, you are right, uh, Germany generally has a high rate um, or is known for being economically very strong, um, but it has a very high rate of tenants. Um, so if you go back historically in the 1950s, after World War II, there was the policy in Germany that everyone should earn enough money to buy um, his or her own uh, house or a flat but this did not work out um, so well. Um, the early policies of one family, one house um, only worked out very well in rural areas. In the cities, it did not uh, work out that well. So if you go to small villages, most people own their homes, uh, their houses mostly, uh, but in the cities, it's not the case. So, especially after the area, era of the welfare state ending in the 70s um, in Germany, um, we can say that Germany is a country with more like so, uh, low social mobility and a high inequality. So uh, despite its economic strength. Yeah. So given this historical background, um, we have for the whole of Germany in 2018, a rate of 42 uh, Forty-three percent of homeowners and seventy uh, fifty-seven percent of renters. So there are more people renting a home in Germany, and in Berlin, as I said, it's eighty-five percent. So we have uh, one point eight million flats in Berlin in total, and one point five million of these flats are rented, and the rest is. Um, in the hands of those who live in the flats, yeah. So, if you if you ask for the reasons why is it like like that, how it developed like that, you can say, um, most generally speaking, we have um, we live in an increasingly individualized society in Germany, um, and we have a big sector, low wage sector in in Germany. A growing low wage sector. So people who work at low wages, 20% of all jobs in Germany are paid uh, at low wages. So under the average wage. And Berlin traditionally is a very poor city with um, lots of people living from social security payments by, by uh, the state. Um, more than 50% of people are poor in a sense. And um, these are, this is also a basis for gentrification, of course. So um, the areas in the city where lots of poor people live are the areas where rents are rising because um, rents were very low. So Volken, I think uh, the next question was around, like, uh, who are the landlords and what is the rent a policy like as well. So if, uh, and also like, it was interesting. I read somewhere where it was saying that a lot of people in Germany, they don't feel like they have to own their homes. I don't know if that's true or not, but perhaps if you could briefly talk about, yeah, who are the landlords, right? Uh, what is the rent a policy like briefly? And then maybe people's attitudes towards renting. Who are the landlords? So. Um, in Berlin, we can say that like 70% of all flats are privately owned and around 30% is publicly owned. So um, that's the situation. And um, out of the 70%, um, we have 
240,000 flats only in the hands of fin big financialized companies. So we have um, so like a very uh, decisive part of, 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 um, of the private flats is in the hands of um, companies who want to make money with the flats and our rents. That's causing a lot of trouble for those who live in these flats, but also for others um, because the prices rise in all flats if financialized companies raise their rents. So to the second question, why do, or well, how is the relation of average people to owning a house or a flat? I think in Berlin, it's um, not affordable to, um, to buy a flat for most people. So it's just too expensive. And if you, if you earn average, if you have an average wage, you will never be able to buy a flat. A flat, I think in the inner city, two rooms is half a million um, euros. That's a lot of money. So um, it is quite impossible actually for most people to buy a flat in this city. Um, so people are not thinking about it. They just want um, a, a decent rent, which is not more than let's say a third of their income. That, that I think that's what most people in Berlin strive for and yes and this even this is quite difficult to achieve in this city uh Volker, uh i was wondering um so 39 percent of people voted against the referendum right 54 percent voted for it and 39 against it like who are these people if 85 percent of uh, berlin are renters why is there 39 percent of people that voted against the referendum um, that's a good question. Um, that's a bit surprising, maybe. Yes, you can say like so much renters, but only 59% are supporting our referendum. Mm. So there are no detailed, there's no detailed data about this, but what you can see from like uh, experiences of, of talking on the street and talking to people on the streets, you can say, um, there are lots of people who own their own flats, even just one flat or two flats, um, and they are against this idea because they think it is against the idea of pro private property. Um, and there are some people who just do not like the leftist scene or leftist um, social groups, which are working for this referendum, which is also a reason. So social distinction, so to say. And also if you look um, at it historically, uh, expropriation is quite a, a, yeah, um, a severe measure. So you take the property of a company and this is something which reminds people of GDR, socialism or fascist, um, systems so this is quite um, um a thing i guess especially in eastern berlin there are people who who know the gdr and the socialist times and who have who fear such um, ideas of course yeah so even though it's a um it's a solidarity movement then um people are against this right um I guess, uh, yeah, the next question, question number two, compared to 2009, the uh, rent prices nearly doubled in Berlin. Like, I think that's like kind of wild. Uh, in response last year, the Berlin city government, uh, they introduced a cap on rent prices, right? Uh, but this April, the legislation was overturned uh, by Germany's highest court as being unconstitutional, right? So yeah, I guess, First, what was the reason for the rapid increase in rents starting 2009? And was there a connection between the campaign on uh, capping the rents and the one for expropriation? And like, yeah, what impact did it have? Uh, what impact did the court ruling have like on your campaign itself? So the first question, why did the rents increase uh, so rapidly from 2009 on? So 
um, yeah, the city got more and more attractive for lots of people uh, from Germany and from abroad. So um, since 2009 and even before, we have more and more people, um, let's say with average or higher incomes coming to the city, more students coming to the city, more uh, refugees coming to the city. Um, and this was, um, I think, this was too much for the city was not prepared. Um, city government was not prepared for so much people. And um, there was no real plan how to um, how to cope with um, with with the housing situation since then. So things just went as they went. And um, politics was always behind this development. Um, and especially um, 2009 and before um, rents, lots of flats were still cheap. Um, so it was easy to buy a flat. It was not half a million. It was maybe 100,000 or even less. Um, so you could easily buy lots of flats if you had the money and speculate. And only a few new housing, social housing buildings were built. So this was kind of the situation which led to rising rents. Yeah. So to the second question, um, what was the connection between the campaign to uh, cap rents and our expropriation co campaign. So to, uh, to be honest, this um, rent cap uh, law was uh, the idea of politicians. It was not our idea. Um, there was no direct connection between our campaign and this law. Um, what we can guess, I, I think, is that um, politics or politicians in Berlin tried to weaken our campaign uh, with this law um, because they wanted to um, do something which gathers lots of public support. Um, and that's why they took this, um, oh, that's why they organized this law to have a very um, strong uh, instrument to, to cap the rents. But in the end, it turned out that um, this law is not legal, um, so it had to be um, it had to be, yeah, cancelled in a way. Um, and what was the relation between our campaign and this this law? In the in the moment the law the law was cancelled, um, of course we mobilized lots of people because we thought that this. Rent cap is a good thing, but it is not going far enough. Um, so we so we supported this rent cap, but it was not our it was not our instrument. In the end, lots of people went on the street on a demonstration in the um, at, at at the day where this law was cancelled because we were against cancelling this law. Um, Ten thousand people uh, were on the street, and we mobilized so much people. But uh, this unfortunately, unfortunately, did not change the cancelling of this uh, rent cap law. Vulcan, I also heard that in many ways, when the uh, rent cap was uh, voted unconstitutional, then in fact that kind of pushed your campaign forward, right? That in some ways it fueled that. I don't know. Maybe if you could tell me if it's true or not. That in fact, what it it fueled it even more. So if maybe you could briefly talk about that. Yeah, um, it fueled our campaign even more. That's probably true, yeah, because lots of people were angry. Um, angry with the politicians who passed a law which was not legal, first of all. So it was left leftist politicians who passed this law and it was just not legal, you know. Um, so people were relying on the 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 the, the things which were um, laid out in this law. So people thought, okay, next five years I will not have a higher rent, and then this law was cancelled. So people were really angry with politicians. The second thing, um, after this law was cancelled, um, people had to pay back the money um, which they could um, save because of this law. 
to their landlord. So they had to pay back sometimes for four, 6,000 of euros, which they saved because of this law. So this was <laughs> making people really angry. Um, and it pushed them to our campaign for sure, yeah. So I wanna to go to the next question, question number three. Uh, yeah, now we just covered kind of like the background and a little bit of the history. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about the campaign. Um, and perhaps you could also talk about like your involvement in the campaign. Um, so as I've heard, as I've read the campaign for expropriation started in 2018, and it was based on articles 14 and 15 of the German constitution, right? That basically stipulate that property has obligations to serve the public good and that legislation can be created to expropriate it, right? So like getting the referendum into the ballot required a minimum, uh, meeting various minimum thresholds of support, which like your campaign far surpassed, I think sometimes doubling or tripling uh, the required numbers. And yeah, I've also heard descriptions about the organizing and it was like, it was very energizing and also just kind of like, uh, yeah, which, you know, things like people around the city are wearing bright yellow and purple vests or that there's like a phone app that mobilizes the public to collect signatures, like these kind of things. And um, yeah, just the campaign seemed to be very widespread. So uh, what was the organizing like? And yeah, uh, yeah. And also perhaps like how broad was the coalition of the people and groups that, that were involved? You know, I think uh, I read in one of, I, I, I listened to one of your interviews previously and in the interview, it was saying that you were saying that it was a very broad coalition. So if you could just elaborate a little bit upon these things. So why, like, why was the campaign so widespread? Um, yeah, I think it was, it was not so exclusive what we did. So we were <laughs> very inclusive with our communication. Um, we did not co communicate to complex things. Um, we had a very simple language. Um, we tried to um, have a hopeful message for the people in Berlin. Um, we, on the other side, we were quite professional with our uh, branding, so to say. So um, the yellow and purple colors everywhere, um, all the flyers, all posters were in the same design. It was, so it was nice to see um, actually. And so that's quite a point, I guess. Um, then we did not uh, like, um, or we had we had the courage to 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 go um, on the streets and to talk to random people on the streets. Oh, this is quite um, challenging, I guess. Um, people have their everyday issues, and then someone comes they don't know and uh, involves them in some kind of talk about housing and quite private things actually. So. Um, we, we trained this over the course of the last three years um, to to talk to average people on the street, to go into houses, to ring the bell, to talk to people, to collect signatures. Mm, I think this was the key element. It was not a, I don't know, um, exclusive lefty idea. It was um, a people's campaign. So we had old people, young people, um, people in the outskirts or suburbs, people from the inner cities, people coming uh, to Berlin recently and people living here since a long time. So this was, I think, um, the most important thing, the mixture of uh, people in the campaign. Yeah. So maybe if we could also talk about like your own participation, like how you got started. I'm, I'm very curious about that. And also, were there any particularly pivotal moments? Like, or, I mean, I guess elements wise, it seems like inclusiveness and accessibility were like key. Maybe if you could talk about a particular instance of that, like what were some key strategic decisions that you made uh, that created that, right? 
uh, that made your campaign successful. And also, uh, yeah. And also just like your participation. I joined this campaign early 2019. Um, so, well, that that time we were just 25 people or 30 people. Um, we met in a small room and some of us even had to stand for two hours or three hours. So it was it was something very small at that time, you know, um, just uh, maybe if, <laughs> crazy utopian idea um, of some people who, and I, me myself, I was also not believing in it. I was just joining and looking and observing, of course, taking part, but I was also not so convinced that this is a good idea. And uh, from time to time, it got bigger and bigger and people were professionalizing this campaign. Um, um, what did I do? I did everything. Um, like you could do ev everything in this campaign. There was actually um, lots of opportunities to do things. You could uh, design posters. You could um, um, go to the street and and um, distribute flyers. You could do the social media thing. Um, I was lots lots of times and giving interviews, speaking publicly. Um, we were like deciding on the strategies how to approach people. Of course, this was this was also important. So, um, of course, uh, I have one maybe one thing is, and this is quite decisive. Maybe um, we had um, the, the decision whether we want to do posters and flyers in different languages, and um, I think one and a half years ago we decided to have. Um, like 10 or 12 languages. Um, so we have lots of migrants in the city who do not speak German. So in the end, we had flyers and posters in Turkish, Kurdish, um, Arabic, Russian, um, French, English. So lots of um, languages and no other party in Berlin or no other campaign has so much languages with which they um, write their materials or yeah um, and this was also very um, decisive I guess you know um, to reach people who live in the city but who not who do not take part in political discourse because of language yeah um, I think this was um, also a big event for the campaign that we decided to do this and um, really did it yeah Great, right, thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, there are various uh, estimates for the cost of these expropriations. Uh, and I think uh, your campaign estimates it to be 9.3 billion euros, but the uh, Berlin city puts it at 35.1 billion euros. So that's like a massive spread, right? Uh, yeah, what, what accounts for such a wide range of price estimates? And uh, yeah, could you talk about how the campaign suggests that even 9.3 billion euros would be quite a lot of money. So uh, yeah, what would be, how, how would you pay for this? Or what, what are the suggestions that you're, that you're proposing for paying for this? So that's a difficult question. Um, that's maybe the most difficult question uh, you, can, you can ask our campaign. Um, so first of all, I'm not an expert for this question. Um, they are, they are very skilled people who um, engage with this question since three or four years. Um, it's a highly difficult um, legal question, but what I can say is that these estimations are politically um, influenced. So um, it depends on your assumptions, which, um, kind of estimation you will arrive at. Um, if you say we want to compensate the companies um, at market value of the property, you will arrive at 35 billion or even more. That would equal buying these houses um, or flats at um, the market prices. And this would be silly actually. This would mean that the city um, buys these houses 
at their speculative worth. Um, this is not what we want. Um, we want to expropriate the um, houses at the worth um, they would have if there was no speculation. So we have a different instrument to estimate their worth and we arrive at 9.3 billion. So I cannot go further into detail, but one thing I can say, our estimation is based on the idea that no one should pay more than a third of his or her salary for the rent. And that's how we arrive at 9.3 9 billion. Um, and the second question, how would we pay this 9.3 billion? We would, uh, we suppose, or um, yeah, our, our approach is to um, pay the debts with the rents, which, which we generate from this um, socialized public housing company in the hands of the public. So the rents would be used to, to pay the debts. And this works in, in theory. Given its uh, non-binding nature, right? Uh, the referendum was uh, a great victory and it gives, uh, it creates a mandate for, for this kind of change, but it is non-binding ultimately, right? Legally non-binding. Uh, so it's actually gonna involve the creation and approval of a Berlin city Senate bill, right? And um, however, the uh, recently elected so Democrat, uh, social democratic uh, party may, uh, may, mayor, uh, she stated that she opposes expropriation, right? I'm not sure if this has changed, uh, but uh, yeah, how do you see the campaign overcoming this political opposition? And what are the tasks and challenges ahead? And you know, how will you tackle these? Yeah, maybe to contextualize um, this point. So the Social Democratic Party is ambivalent about our referendum. The leaders of the party are against it. And the base of the party is in favor of it. Um, so that's a tricky situation because the people who are in the Social Democratic Party, <clears throat> um, they are quite diverse. Um, and the people who lead the party are more on the side of the real estate industry. And the people who are um, at the base of the party, um, they, they um, are on the side of the tenants. So that's quite tricky. So we try to um, cooperate with the um, base of the party to, to put the leaders of the party uh, under pressure. Um, but that's not entirely working. Um, um, so what we do is to to create events where we meet with um, the, so, the Social Democratic Party members and talk to them and try to convince them. We do this since two or three years. This is nothing new, actually. Um, it's working to a certain degree, but the like the leaders of the party, they they are really very stubborn on on their position that they do not want the expropriation at all. Um, so. I think um, it's very hard to change their mind. Um, and on the other side, this is a referendum. So one million Berliners voted for expropriation. And um, it's a, not, not only a question of housing rights, it's a question of democracy. Um, how can a social democratic party ignore the vote uh, of the majority of people living in Berlin? This is, I think, um, also quite a yeah, uh, powerful argument to put social Democrats under pressure. You cannot ignore the vote of um, the vote of the people. But in 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 recent um, history, we have lots of other examples where politics ignored uh, the vote of the people. Um, especially the votes um, coming from a referendum. So there was a vote 
um, concerning the, the um, airport uh, Tegel um, and then politics acted against this referendum vote. So it's nothing unusual, so to say that a referendum is ignored by politics in, in Berlin. And I, I personally think we will not succeed in convincing the Social Democratic Party. So then my follow up question is what happens then? Is, is it just, does it just become a type of like, I don't know if the word would be like battle of wills? Uh, like what would, if the Social Democratic Party, if they don't turn, but there is this clear mandate for it, then what happens? I can only speculate um, what happens. So this is a non-binding referendum, first of all. So there is no legal uh, necessity to do what the people voted for. It's just a recommendation. Um, so that's the first point. The second, uh, what happens now is that uh, politicians try to um, shift this campaign into an expert commission, which will think and uh, discuss this um, um, expropriation um, law, which we uh, suppose to be enacted for one year. So there will be experts discussing discussing this law and its feasibility um, and next year they will come up with a recommendation um, which then goes to politics again so it what uh, in fact happened that this uh, whole referendum was postponed and um, it, it was um, um, transformed into an expert uh, hearing um, which is led by politics but in this expert hearing, uh, also people from our campaign will take part. So somehow it is um, being, yeah, uh, trans it is, I think it will transform into something else. That's my speculation. Yeah, the expropriate campaign uh, seems to draw a distinction between nationalizing and socializing housing. Uh, could you briefly elaborate on this distinction and why is such a distinction important to the campaign? Mm, yeah, for sure. As, um, so th that's quite important um, because uh, as I already said, there's this um, historical fear um, uh, of expropriation um, coming from the communist um, systems and the communist um, history, also fascist history of Germany. Um, and that's why we um, propose a social socialization of property, not a nationalization. A nationalization was is what was made in, uh, in, in, in by, by this um, by the communists and by the fascists. They took property of private people, for example, Jews, then as the Nazis did, and they made it um, the property of the state. Yeah, so the state took property of private people and then managed it as a state's asset. Um, this is not what we want to do. What we want to do is that um, we um, socialize property of the housing companies which are um, um, competition or competitive and which want to make a return on, which want to generate return on investment by our rents. And we take this property, um, compensate them with, uh, as we said, I don't know, nine to 30 billion euros. And then this property is not going into the hands of the state, it's going into the hands of a publicly owned and publicly managed housing company. So it will be an asset of the public, of the uh, society of Berlin, of the Berliners. And that's completely different than um, having a state owned um, company which manages the property, which exi already exists. We have um, like around 12% um, um, of all flats in Berlin are managed by companies which belong to the state of Berlin. So if you would propose this, this would be nothing new. We want a company that is owned by the public. 
and that's socialization it's not nationalization that's a big difference and it this is also very important um, it, it was important during the campaign to make this difference to tell people it's not that we want uh, a huge new state company um, managing our flats Great, thank you very much. So, well, actually, the last question, we'll just save that uh, as your concluding remarks. Uh, basically, just, you know, we wanted to see, to get some insights or advice that you might have for other movements to replicate the success that you've had. Uh, so, yeah, we'll we'll save that for concluding remarks and we'll just move on to the Q&A. So, yeah, thank you, Volkan. And uh, basically, this concludes the interview section. And now we'll turn it over to... Uh, Taylor and to Stephen, who will run the Q&A with the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Dayan. So, 저희 박효준님이 이제 사전에 주신 질문이 있습니다. So, uh, after the general election in Germany and after the referendum in Berlin, uh, has there been any changes to the uh, policies regarding the protection of tenants, like rent, uh, rent ceiling? Has there been any changes? to those policies? Mm, no, not yet. Um, it's too early. I, I, I think um, the elections are just one month ago and parties are negotiating their new project. So there's nothing, there is nothing new at the moment, no. So Greg has po uh, posted the question that said, uh, Previously, Berlin voted to institute rent control, which was unsurprisingly condemned by the mainstream press, who accused the city of creating a housing shortage crisis. Can you explain the context of that policy and its, its effects that may be missing from the media narrative? Yes. Um, okay. The, the, the argument is that um, uh, if you do a rent cap, law or if you pass a rent cap law then it will will not be profitable anymore to build new flats because the uh, revenues from these flats will be too uh, low if you have a rent cap so mainstream media and media which is close to real estate interests um, bring up this story that a rent cap uh, indirectly um, makes it economically um, senseless to build new flats. Um, but in fact, um, this argument is, is built on the assumption that uh, flats should bring a lot of money and that they um, that you, you should have high rents for these flats. So this is quite a crazy argument, actually. Um, it doesn't make, doesn't make any sense in the end. So uh, the question is that, uh, so previously we talked about the difference between nationalization and socialization. So uh, I hope uh, maybe you can exp uh, elaborate on the difference in that. So when uh, homes are nationalized, then they become the property of the state. But when they become socialized, then who own those property? Uh, so when, from the, uh, would it be like, when, when we say uh, housing is socially owned, is it like a local government that owns it or some other entity that owns those housing? If you could elaborate on that. Uh, the, I don't know if something similar in South Korea exists, but in uh, Germany, we have um, a legal construction called Anstalt Öffentlichen Rechts. And this is um, a public construction, a legal, public construction for a legal subject. So it is neither private nor um, state owned. Um, it is a company that is working for the interest of the public and they are already, oh, it's not even a company, it's a legal subject. Um, so um, this is something uh, specifically German um, and uh, it already exists in the, uh, for example, um, the um, 
media outlets which are um, financed by uh, everyone in Germany. We call Anstalt, we call uh, Anstalt öffentlichen Rechts. It's uh, the main public uh, media outlets um, which are financed by a monthly um, uh, payment by everyone. Um, and they are neither uh, possessed by the state nor private companies. They are just um, owned by the public, so to say, and they are also governed by the public. So the ones who decide over these um, um, organizations are all parties, um, representatives of the churches, of the trade unions, of civil society organizations. They are um, somehow making the the governance of um, these media outlets, and we want to create something similar for the uh, housing area um, with this legal construction of Anstalt Öffentlichen Rechts, which is, as I said, neither state-owned nor privately owned. It's a third thing, and it's a legal construction which is already working in some areas. So why not in housing? 아, 지금 다음 질문은요. 김종민 님께서 질문해 주셨어요. Other than the Social Democratic Party, uh, what were the position of other uh, progressive and left parties in Germany about this uh, movement for expropriation? And uh, did other uh, left parties have any participation in the movement or support? We have two other parties in the left spectrum, the Greens and the left, it's called the left party. Um, so the Greens in Berlin always supported our campaign, um, but there were also some people, uh, important people among the Greens which were against it. But um, most of the uh, members of the Green Party were in favor of expropriation as the last mean to solve the housing crisis. So they said, we will do everything else before, and as a last mean, expropriation is a good idea. That was their um, framing or their narrative, so to say. Uh, the left party um, was completely behind us from the beginning. They were supporting us ideologically, organizationally, and uh, also materially with uh, resources, money, and so on. So they were quite close to us. They were doing their own um, election um, campaigns with our idea. They really, um, yes, incorporated our idea into their party um, uh, activities and, and ideology. So um, Greens and Left Party were behind us, SP, uh, like the Social Democrats um, were ambivalent. That's the situation. And besides that, um, we have um, lots of trade, like major trade unions, which are huge in Germany, behind us. Uh, so we have the trade union for, um, for real estate. We have the trade union for service um, jobs. We have the, uh, like lots of trade unions uh, are supporting this uh, campaign. And that's quite a huge thing, actually. My question is about the social uh, background and your context, why the Berliners chose uh, to expropriate instead of uh, uh, applying universal rent control. Because in Netherlands, there's a rent control system and it applies to social enterprise or public enterprise or private or whoever owns the, uh, the house. And then it, it, then it is already considered as a social housing and everyone benefits from that rent control. Good question. So there are already like uh, policies for rent control in place in Berlin. Um, but these policies can only freeze the rents at a, in a certain like um, at a certain amount. And it, this amount may not be like um, violated 10% up or 10, like um, you cannot, you cannot um, make rents higher, um, like or deviate too much from the average rent in a certain area. That's what is in place. Um, then it is in place that certain areas, it's called milieu schutz, like the social structure of a certain neighborhood should be um, saved. So the people living in a certain area um, 
they should be um, able to pay the rents um, compared to the people who come to this area. So the, the policies are aiming at, at keeping a certain structure, social structure in a certain area. Um, so that that people can stay there if they live there longer. Um, this is also in place. The expropriation thing would be a thing that aims at the big companies because the big companies, what they do is to, to buy flats um, and then modernize these flats to make them um, very luxury flats in the end and then take lots of rent for a luxury um, modernized flat. And there's no like policy which can really counter this. Um, you cannot, uh, it, it is harder to, um, or it was hard to, to, to forbid a company to modernize its flats, you know? Um, but by modernization, you make um, the flats um more economically attractive and more worthy and that's the problem and that's why we want to expropriate the big companies because then this modernization cannot go on and uh, plus the newly built houses in berlin are mostly in the in the field of luxury housing so you pay for a newly built apartment um 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 euros rent per month. And it's 80 square meters. No one can afford this. So this is what mostly is newly built in the inner city. It's luxury housing with very high rents. And there, there is no legal measure against, uh, against this uh, development. So that's why we propose this expropriation. Uh, first, uh, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to talk to uh, us in Korea uh, for today's event. Uh, my question is that I think uh, housing prices and rents are also very heavily affected uh, and determined by the financial and uh, fis fiscal policy, fiscal policy of the government. Uh, in, in case of Korea, we follow the example of the United States with very low, almost uh, nearly 0% interest rate and uh, also a lot of quantitative easing. Uh, and over, over the period of two years, uh, we've had like 50% or sometimes even double increase in housing prices. So I assume uh, in Germany, especially Berlin, it would most likely be very similar. So uh, I wanted to ask if, uh, your movement also uh, is thinking about uh, these uh, fiscal policy and its influence on the housing market as well. Yes, um, it is nearly the same story here, I would say. So um, you have very low interest rates. Um, that's a reason why um, you can uh, easily get a loan um, and buy a property if you can repay it and um, the, the return on investment on a real estate property is one of the most secure and one of the of one of the highest at the moment. So um, pushing your capital into real estate is very promising at the moment, and this is the fact since years. So it is more promising to invest your money in a house or in a, like any real estate um, and to speculate on a growth and worth than investing your money, so to say, in, uh, in a company or in, uh, in gold or in just letting your money uh, stay on a bank account, you know? Um, so what, more wealthy or more rich people do since years is to buy either um, real estate by themselves or to invest in the financial companies which are uh, speculating with real estate. So if you look at uh, the companies which we want to expropriate, 
they have big institutional investors like pension funds they are they have investors like blackrock uh, hedge funds they have a huge uh, amount of private investors people like you and me investing in um as in a in a um, financialized housing company uh, maybe we even live in their flats so it's quite an absurd logic we pay our rents um and then we pay them um with our rents and on the other side we maybe also um invest in a um at the stock stock exchange and invest in their company so we we profit from uh, paying rents to a company which then um uh, uh rises in worth um and we own their stock exchange um uh or we we own their assets um so it's that we invest in companies which uh, generate worth for pension funds in Norway or for pension funds in Germany by our rents. This is the situation, the economic situation. Uh, this is a quite absurd economic logic, but it is working at the moment. Yeah. So I think uh, we see the government or the like municipality uh, getting land and building housing to supply housing to the people. We see a lot of those cases. But I think we, what, we don't see expropriation very often in a capitalist economic system or uh, and liberal democracy. Uh, take uh, basically expropriating housing that's already being, being built and uh, our rent is being rented out. Uh, so I think uh, the current opposition to the expropriation movement are that uh, these social democrats uh, are uh, talking about the possible unconstitutionality of such a project. And uh, also, as we mentioned before, there was a lot of discussion about how if we uh, expropriate housing, then in the future, uh, pe people won't, uh, people will be less, uh, willing to supply housing because of the fear that it will be uh, expropriated again. So I'm sure you, your uh, movement already gave this kind of opposing arguments a lot of thought. So uh, what, what's, your, what's your movement's position on those uh, opposing arguments? So, well, yeah, first of all, um, we think that Okay, for the, the argument, um, I just repeat, if you expropriate um, companies' uh, property, um, like housing companies' property, then no one will ever again invest in housing in Berlin. This is often said, but uh, because we create a bad image for the city and so on. Um, this is exactly what we want to do. We don't want um, the big financialized companies to invest in housing in Berlin. We just want to get rid of them. We want to deliberately create a political risk for them to invest in our city. We just don't want them here. Uh, we want them to get out of the city and leave us in peace uh, uh, with uh, decent rents. That's why, why we uh, have this kind of radical approach because we want to get this company out of our city. We want uh, Berliners to um, live in affordable um, flats. And this will not, not work with these companies dictating the rents in our city. So that's why they have to leave our city. That's the first thing. And um, the second thing is, yes, there is a social housing um, process uh, and social housing is built in Berlin, but there is simply not enough space in Berlin to build new houses. It is very dense, a very dense city. Um, and the thing that if you want to build social housing, you have to uh, be able to afford the ground and like the, the ground where you build the house. And if it, if this is not even affordable, you cannot build a social housing unit if the ground is too expensive. And that's what, what is the case. If you buy a new ground or new area in Berlin where nothing is built on, it is too expensive as it would be profitable to build a social housing unit on it. 
um, because the revenues from social housing are too low to pay the debts for the ground. And this is why it will just not work to build more and more social housing units because no, no one can economically um, make this with um, make the, make this happen. Actually, it is just not possible. Thank mm -hmm. you for your participation in this Q and A session. Um, we have two more people with the last minute questions. So uh, we are in Munich right now. So uh, I wanted to ask uh, what might be the possibility of this kind of same movement also happening in other cities in Germany. We in Munich. Uh, we've had uh, our rents rise 10% in the last month alone. So we are trying to build our movement here. So I wanted to ask if you have any advices or uh, insights on how to make this the same thing happen in other cities in Germany. Uh, greetings to Munich, first of all. Um, um, that it, like, you have to consider the um, the constitution of uh, the federal state you're living in. So if the constitution of, uh, in case of Munich, Bavaria is giving you the opportunity to have a referendum on um, this kind of question for Bavaria, for the federal state of Bavaria, you can do the sim you can do a similar thing, of course. Um, if the constitution of Bavaria is different than the constitution of Berlin, and it does not allow this, then you have to consider a different uh, approach. Um, this is what I can tell you. I don't know if it's um, possible in Bavaria to, to hold a referendum on this question. Um, and if you do it in Bavaria, it has to be, I, I guess, for the whole of Bavaria, not only for Munich. Um, this is a thing. Um, the special thing about Berlin, Berlin is a city and at the same time a federal state in Germany. So it has its own constitution, it has its own um, legal framework, and it is only a city. Munich is a city, but it is not a federal state. It is part of the federal state of Bavaria. So the rules of Bavaria are valid for Munich, um, just for the legal side of, of this whole thing. Um, and for like um, organizational support, just contact us. We have lots of people in the campaign who help people from other cities in Germany, may it be Hamburg, Frankfurt, uh, Dortmund, and so on, who are in contact with them and to give them um, advice and support. Um, and they, the cooperation is working very, very well, actually. Um, you just write a mail to, to the campaign, yeah. Vielen Dank. Viel Glück noch. Viel Erfolg. Uh, uh, from our perspective in Korea, we are very jealous of the achievement that uh, you have made in Berlin uh, and the organization that you have built to grow that tenant power. Uh, like, for example, previously you talked about even in the Social uh, Democratic Party, the, the base is very supportive of the movement. Uh, so first, uh, we're quite curious uh, how you could achieve that? Was there like a, a, a tenant organization in each um, like district of uh, Berlin? Or uh, I'm sure there was a lot of opposition even in at the base level, not e even in the leadership of the Social Democratic Party. So I'm sure there were a lot of uh, lobbies against your organization. So. Uh, so we are curious about the, uh, what you could, what you did to basically build that support, even in the party that's opposing uh, your movement. And uh, second, uh, here in Seoul, we don't uh, currently have a very uh, high level of support for any, or even any sort of readiness for tenant uh, organization. We, we, there, there are uh, not there isn't a robust organization to grow tenant power. So uh, we were wondering if there was a point where your movement kind of went beyond a critical mass or a tipping point, because uh, we, we, we're not sure if uh, it, does, it doesn't even seem very visible or uh, like in any near future to us. 
And the third part of the question is, so in Seoul, Korea, we don't have that any tenant organization and speculation. There is a lot of uh, cultural media and social pressure towards speculation. So it's, an, it's not a very favorable env environment to organize. Uh, so if you were in our shoes in this, like there is no like infrastructure, there is no organization, what would be the thing uh, you would start doing? Okay. Um... That's a lot. So the first question, if I got it right, was um, how, how did we get to this point to be so successful? Um, so I think there's, there's the first and most important thing is that we have a legal process. It's a legal process. And this is the only issue of our campaign. We want to make a referendum. You know, it's not an abstract idea or a utopia or whatever. It's a referendum. It's something people can vote for in the end or against. And they have the choice, you know. This is very motivating for all of us. It was the most motivating thing for the most of us because in the end, you have something where people can decide upon. Yeah. Um, so this is very important. Uh, second thing. Um, critical mass, yes, there was a point, um, because um, I think until 2019, beginning of 2019, we had um, just the inner circle of the campaign, and then we decided to decentralize the campaign. So we started to build small uh, communities in every district of the city with supporters of us. They started with three or four people. And they grew to hundreds of people in the end. Uh, we decentralized the campaign completely and made small communities all over the city uh, and supported these communities with information, with skills, with knowledge, uh, and so on uh, from our center, from the inner circle of the campaign. So I think this is um, what I would also recommend to you if you have no organizational structure yet, decentralize um your 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 already existing structure try to build small communities all over the city provide them with the skills and information to make this thing bigger and let it grow uh, organically from the bottom up um all over the the city you want to uh, you want to campaign in and try to find something where people can concentrate on like a referendum a legal process um, or even smaller uh, uh, demonstration next year where you want to mobilize lots of people. Um, that's an that's a important thing. So to, to have something where you can concentrate the attention and the efforts of lots of people on and where they can cooperate on um, to find something like that. And that would be a recommendation, I guess. Yeah. Well, that was the final question um, that nearly concludes today's event. Thank you, Volkan Simon, for being part of the ISC's Progressive Forum. Your electoral victory was very inspiring to hear about. Uh, it seems like many hurdles still remain, but we look forward to seeing your campaign for socialized housing blossom. And we look forward to continuing exchanges with you, sharing and strengthening each other's struggles. Um, thank you a lot for having me here. I, um, I appreci appreciate a lot your um, invitation and I hope we, we stay in touch. Feel free to contact me if you have any um, questions, uh, further questions which could not be answered here. Or if you want to have a deeper contact to the campaign, I can um, hand your contact on to other people in the campaign who, uh, who help people from other countries or who get in touch even more. Yeah. Um, so thank you a lot, of course. Yeah. Thank you, Volkan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank you. 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 Thank you.
네, 모두 감사합니다. 네, 모두 수고하셨습니다. 수고하셨습니다. 고맙습니다. 고맙습니다. 감사합니다. 감사합니다.